All right, finally on ALS, uh, there is one FDA-approved medication known as Riliazol. Uh, Riliazol is an interesting medication. It acts against glutamate in the central nervous system. Uh, a hy hypothesis was that since glutamate <clears throat> is a excitatory neurotransmitter, that maybe this was somehow harmful to the large motor neurons. Um, basically, it tends to work better for the bulbar onset cases, but it extends survival by only about three months. Okay, so this is certainly not a, not a fantastic uh, treatment option that we have. All right, now let's move on and talk about my, uh, spinal cord conditions that tend to involve sensory pathways. <clears throat> Okay, and so first let's talk about syringomyelia. And let me draw out another spinal cord here. Okay, syringomyelia tends to involve typically the center of the cord. What we have is a central cavitation of the cord. Usually this happens after trauma. Okay, and Progressively, we get an enlargement <clears throat> of the center of the spinal cord. So if we remember our anatomy here of the crossing pain and temperature fibers, okay? And so if we have a cavity that is extending forward, the earliest involvement is going to be of the crossing pain and temperature fibers. And so these patients present with a progressive loss of pain and temperature. And this uh, you know, could be anywhere, but most of these tend to occur in the uh, mid-cervical area. So however long this cavity extends, if it extends from C5 to C8, well, the patient's going to have a loss of pain and temperature in that distribution. So a classic story would be someone who can't feel temperature in their hands okay, or in their arms. Keep burning themselves when cooking because they can't feel pain and temperature. That would be a pretty good story for syringomyelia. <clears throat> As this cavity extends and involves other areas, uh, we may have even upper motor neuron manifestations, lots of other things. But the earliest symptom is almost always a loss of pain and temperature. And then we want to image that area of the spine. Um, there are some surgical options for this, but, but these are very, very tricky uh, to manage. Now, we may also have a, sp a tumor that originates from the center of the cord. And the two most common spinal tumors that we see are ependymomas, ependymomas which tend to occur in people in their 30s, early 40s, most common age, and astrocytomas. Astrocytomas tend to occur in kids, maybe from age 5 to 10 would be a typical onset. And these are slow growing, so patients often have progressive symptoms over months, sometimes even years before it's diagnosed. But again, coming back to our anatomy, tumors that originate in the center of the cord tend to spread out laterally. And one interesting thing that's often discussed with these tumors is, if you remember here, how these fibers in the spinal thalamic tract are arranged. Remember, the sacral fibers are lateral. The cervical fibers are medial. And so if we have a mass lesion coming out from the center, we get what's called sacral sparing because the sacral fibers are lateral. So you'll have a loss of sensation, okay, but it tends to spare the sacral area. And of course, typically, you're going to involve upper motor neuron pathways, so there'll be some spasticity, and you try to localize the level of the lesion. But the sacral sparing would be a, a distinctive feature um, for a central spinal cord tumor. Mm. Now... Very important, and perhaps we've talked enough about this in previous lectures, but B12 deficiency would be a relatively common condition that presents with mainly sensory manifestation. And by that, I don't mean numbness and tingling, but it's from degeneration of the posterior columns. That is the hallmark of B12 deficiency. Usually an older individual, although not always, uh, that presents with predominantly involvement of the posterior columns. Okay, so what would that look like? Well, if you uh, have degenerated most of your posterior columns, you don't have good proprioception. So typically, uh, falling is the major manifestation of B12 deficiency. Um, the upper motor neuron pathways are also involved. 
Okay, so the cortical spinal tract here is involved also. So there are some upper motor neuron manifestations. This may not be very dramatic, okay, but you might have some brisk leg reflexes, maybe a Babinski sign. Okay, and the third manifestation we see commonly is peripheral neuropathy, so usually some stocking glove numbness and tingling. Now, there may be lots of other things. The optic nerve may be involved in some cases. Uh, there may be cognitive changes. Okay, that's sometimes known as a megaloblastic madness that we'll see with B12 deficiency. They may have uh, an altered uh, taste or smell, glossitis, loss of hair, vitiligo. There can be a whole bunch of other things. But the neurologic manifestations are mainly due to degeneration of the posterior columns. Now, one other point on B12 deficiency. You have a patient with a severe loss of vibration, proprioception, and you get a B12 level, and it's borderline. It's 200. You know, a normal level extends down to 200. Um, very important in that case, don't just give the patient B12 injections. <clears throat> we want to find out because, you know, some patients will see that have a B12 level of 200 and they have no symptoms. <clears throat> you want to know, is it real or not? So typically in that case, uh, we want to get a homocysteine and methylmalonic acid level because these are very sensitive, very specific, 98, 99%. They're going to be elevated if the patient has a symptomatic B12 deficiency. And so these patients give them injections and typically do extremely well. Now, I should mention, this is not common, um, but we do occasionally see patients after anesthesia with nitrous oxide that have a dramatic B12 deficiency that comes on uh, after surgery, in the days, weeks, and months following surgery. So if someone presents with something that looks like B12 deficiency after surgery and anesthesia, they probably got nitrous oxide. And again, that responds very well to treatment. <clears throat> okay, now uh, briefly, uh, another sensory condition that would involve the spinal cord is tabes dorsalis. This is a late manifestation of syphilis. Um, which we are seeing more cases of syphilis because of the HIV population. And tabes dorsalis tends to involve two areas, the posterior columns. So again, like B12 deficiency, severe balance problems, loss of vibration, proprioception, but also the posterior nerve roots are involved. So these patients often have back pain and a lot of uh, radicular symptoms along with it. Okay, and our last mainly sensory condition that involves the spinal cord is a posterior spinal artery stroke. This is kind of the opposite of an anterior spinal artery stroke because now the involvement is purely to the dorsal columns. So remember, when you think stroke, it comes on suddenly. This is not like B12 deficiency or tabes dorsalis. Patient was fine, and then all of a sudden, they have a stroke in this area. And so the, the key things to remember then is there's no weakness. There's no loss of pain and temperature, okay? But if you, if you lose your posterior columns, you have no idea where your legs are in space. And obviously, these patients then can't walk. And you check vibration, you check proprioception by moving the toe up and down, maybe moving the whole leg up and down, and they have a profound loss of vibration. And so the walking in these patients tends to be with a stomping gait, okay? And they're stomping because they're desperately trying to get some proprioception up to the brain. <clears throat> now, uh, I'd like to conclude by talking about two hereditary myelopathies. Okay, these will be two new conditions for you most likely, but um, they're not uncommon, and so you, you need to know about these. One is known as uh, hereditary spastic paraparesis. Okay, so obviously we want to ask about a, a family history, and these can be autosomal dominant. That's most often, or recessive, or even uh, X-linked. Okay, so if we have a family history of myelopathy, uh, that's when we'll think about these conditions. And these can be what's known as an uncomplicated hereditary spastic paraparesis, where patients present mainly with a, a progressive spastic weakness, tends to be mainly in the legs. Okay, they may have a little vibratory loss, but it's mainly with an upper motor neuron weakness. Or some of these may be complicated, so you find involvement elsewhere. The patient may even have ataxia, may have peripheral neuropathy. Okay, don't worry about those. But I would like you to know, if you see a patient with a progressive myelopathy in a family history, 
it's probably hereditary spastic paraparesis. Okay, genetics testing for this condition has improved significantly such that we can diagnose about two-thirds of these by doing specialized genetics testing. And I want to include here one a story that is fairly typical here. You can see it uh, on your screen. This is a 34-year-old man who played sports and was normal until the age of 14 when he seemed to, in his words, walk like a drunk. And this problem steadily progressed. He's used cane for the last five years, and his arms are normal. Okay, that would be important. The hereditary spastic paraparesis mainly affects the legs. And so you get your story, and five, he's had five similarly affected male relatives. What does that tell you? All males, so that would suggest an X-linked condition. And his examination revealed spasticity, hyperreflexia in the legs, normal sensation, which it typically is. So in this case, this patient ended up having an X-linked hereditary spastic paraparesis. And you can uh, be very specific in terms of even saying where the mutation is. Okay, finally, last condition we'll talk about. Another hereditary spinal cord condition is known as adrenomyeloneuropathy, A-M-N, adrenomyeloneuropathy. And this is a condition that has an interesting history dating all the way back to around 1910. Um, we usually think of uh, adrenoleukodystrophy and, and ignore this condition we see in adults known as adrenomyeloneuropathy. Okay, and so eventually, uh, over time and in the 70s, it was uh, found that there were very long-chain fatty acids in the uh, adrenal cortical cells. So this was classified as a lipid storage disease. Okay, and then uh, it was discovered that, hey, we're finding adults that present with this progressive myelopathy, spinal cord syndrome, and uh, it was diagnosed as adrenomyelopathy adrenomyeloneuropathy. Okay, and you can find those very long-chain fatty acids also in the brain. And they've mapped out the genetics of this, which I won't go into. Okay, but uh, what I would like you to know is the presentation. And there are several different phenotypes. Okay, adrenoleukodystrophy presents with the rapidly progressive childhood cerebral syndrome. Okay, sometimes that is delayed, and we call that an adolescent cerebral form. And then there's adrenomyeloneuropathy, and then finally, we do see some asymptomatic carriers, women who have symptoms. Okay, now the childhood form, this does not really fit here into our spinal cord syndrome, but these kids typically have onset of symptoms before the age of 10 and present with dramatic demyelination in the brain. It tends to be worse in the parietal occipital area, and they have progressive behavioral and cognitive deficits, a very sad condition, and uh, typically totally disabled within just several years and uh, pass away. Okay, so that's the rapidly progressive childhood form. The adolescent cerebral form is, kind of think of it as a delayed childhood form. So the symptoms begin maybe between the age of 10 and 20, uh, but again, they don't do well. It's not as rapidly progressive, but it's uh, otherwise similar. Now, what I would like you to know about is this adrenomyeloneuropathy condition, because these are typically young men late 20s, uh, perhaps up to 40, okay, so 30 to 40, that would be kind of a typical age, and they present with a progressive spastic weakness in the legs, all right, because most of the involvement in the spinal cord tends to be thoracic. Now, they may have some cerebral involvement, and as you can see here uh, from this one study of 112 patients, about 54% presented with just pure spinal cord involvement, about 46 had some involvement of the brain as well. And of course, those patients tend to have more complications, behavioral, cognitive, and it overall tends to be a, a more aggressive form. Okay, so if you see a young man with a progressive myelopathy, I want you to have this adrenomyeloneuropathy condition in mind. Uh, and again, especially if you're finding an uncle, a brother, or some uh, family history. How do you diagnose it? Well, get an MRI of the brain and spine and especially looking at the thoracic spine, where typically we see atrophy. Okay, and the blood test that is most helpful to confirm the diagnosis is a very long chain fatty acids, VLCFA, very long chain fatty acids. That helps to confirm uh, the diagnosis. Now, finally, uh, if you see a woman presenting with a uh, 
progressive myelopathy, spastic weakness, and she says, oh yeah, all these uh, brothers and uncles have had this more severe problem. Well, it turns out about 20% of uh, women that are heterozygous for uh, adrenal leukodystrophy have symptoms. And it resembles what I just talked about with adrenal myeloma neuropathy in men. So it's spastic weakness, but it tends to present later, maybe in the 40s, and it tends to be much more mild. Okay, so we even want to consider this condition in women who are coming down with perhaps a more mild myelopathy.